do-it-yourself turbines, a micro 26 channel receiver for anything from toys to giant scale planes that also acts as a backup, or the incredible mechanics behind tiny but capable 3D helis. It's time to bring back cool tech. Let's start off small, really small. This is the new Powerbox Systems PBR26XS, a very special micro receiver for their core and atom radios. I say special because it's a lot more than just a small 26 channel bus receiver. Sure, it works as a standalone full range receiver for any models that run on a bus signal, such as a quad racing drone, fly wireless heli, foamies running a flight controller, or you could even use it as a single antenna option for power boxes. It links like any other power box receiver and to assure maximum compatibility, it can output P2 bus, SRXL or Futaba S bus signals, among others. But here is where it gets special. Take the Powerbox 26XS and any other Powerbox receiver with a fast track output, set them both to fast track and plug them together. With both receivers linked to your radio, your setup just went from either a single antenna receiver to a dual antenna, or your dual antenna receiver is now a triple. Why though, as the original dual receivers are already bulletproof? Personally, I feel that the number one benefit here is when using a single receiver. Being able to place the small PBR26XS far away from that main receiver, at the other end of the plane, in the rudder even, this allows an entirely different receiving location to the single receiving position from the initial receiver, which even if it is a PBR26D or a 9D with dual antennas, realistically, the antennas are never more than a few inches apart. This capability to create some serious distance between antennas, even without using a power box and a traditional dual receiver setup can be especially interesting for models with lots of carbon fiber. You can even still hook up an iGyro sat, just like before. All you need is a Y lead. Connect both the sat and the 26XS into your receiver's fast track port. You can even still use a GPS to control your gyro gain, simply adding in an extra Y lead or using the hub. The setup I'm going to go with when building this epic FC1 jet behind me is now likely going to be two PBR26Ds in the fuselage going into the power box and one of them attached to one of these 26 XS's all the way in the tail for added peace of mind. In this case, the iGyro sat will be connected directly into a power box, specifically in this case, the Mercury SR2. It's worth pointing out that the 26 XS functions and is therefore classed as an independent receiver by our radio. So bear in mind that the Atom can handle up to two receivers. So that's either two receivers or one receiver with a 26 XS, while the core can handle up to four receivers, allowing for two receivers, each with their own 26 XS connected. In both cases, it still returns full telemetry, just like the entire range. Until the FC1 is built though, being so versatile, we can test it out here. This is the OMP M1 Evo. We already tested the original version a few years ago, so I'll try not to repeat myself. I'll just copy my own couple of tricks from my first video, and it's time to set her up. This time though, we're going core. What's new though, aside from new colors that match the rest of the lineup? Well, it's lighter, which is always positive. This is achieved partly due to the new carbon frame and central aluminum backbone. It also comes with a new, more crash resistant tail motor and a really interesting feature for those who are more of a heli pro than I am. It has an adjustable length tail boom, allowing for CG adjustments. To get it working with our Powerbox radio, the first step 
is to make up a connecting wire to go from the silly little white connector to a standard Futaba that we can use with our receiver. It would be nice to see this come in the box, but still, it's an easy fix. As with basically all helis these days, it uses a flybarless system. So setup in the radio is super easy and the flybarless will do all the mixing automatically without the need for any special heli software. We just set up aileron, elevator and rudder channels as usual and we'll create and name our own motor, pitch and rescue channels manually. Pitch we will leave as standard, minus 100 to plus 100, while for the throttle we can set it to match our personal preferences. In my case, I'm using a dual rate so that we can have both a progressive 0 to 100 in one mode and a flat percentage, or 3D idle, in the other. I've also set up a safety kill switch using the servo cut function. So basically, whenever this switch is active, the motor will not rotate, no matter what position my throttle or dual rates or idle switches are in. Just like its predecessor, this nifty little heli comes with a rescue mode, which either keeps the heli upright when flying with it in this mode, or even returning it to upright from no matter what position you're in if you activate it when you run out of skill. That one is going to be handy for sure. Proof is in the pudding though. So how does she fly? Let's go find out. But what's better than all this microtech in such a small heli? How about applying all the same genius into a slightly bigger version, which is even more powerful and thanks to its size is also significantly more stable. This is exactly what you get with the bigger brother, the brand new M2 Evo. Okay, maybe it was new and just released when I received it, much like the M1 Evo. Unfortunately, finishing the house, Catching up on flying, everything has and is taking forever, as you probably know from previous and recent videos. But the good news is, we already know that the helis have been a great success. So, all that's left to do with this brand new M2 is install the 26XS, hand it over to someone who actually knows what they're doing when flying helis, and really put it through its paces. But that's enough about helis. We're mostly plain guys here and not much can beat a turbine model. But despite having some crazy specs, we often don't know much about how our micro turbines actually work. That's why when I was offered to try out the Sterling DIY WS15 turbofan kit, a DIY turbine, I couldn't resist having a peek inside. Sure, it may not be an exact copy of our single stage turbines, but it's still cool nonetheless. Not too sure what to expect. First impressions were good. The many parts came well protected with a number of serious bearings and a heavy duty centre shaft. After laying everything out on the table, the two bags of 100 nuts and 100 bolts had me a bit concerned about how long this might take. 
but it wasn't too bad. To my surprise, the entire unit is actually 3D printed. And even though by far not the worst I've ever seen, you can make out the lines or the layers of the 3D printing. The colors match quite well with what you might expect for all the metallic parts. And even though it takes some figuring out, the parts are not actually printed in these colors and they're actually painted, which does explain why a few of the parts that are a push fit needed a bit more force than one would have expected due to that extra thickness of that layer of colour. I couldn't help but find it funny how that extra layer of paint made some parts rather a tight fit, requiring quite a bit more force than expected, while on the other hand the really impressive bearings are arguably not even needed given that they fit so loosely that I would guess that the parts spin around the bearings rather than thanks to them. As for the online manual, I'm afraid it's terrible. It does correctly show you which step comes next, but it doesn't show you which parts are to be used. And despite being conveniently numbered, or indeed which way they should be facing, it's still down to your best guess. Thankfully, their video manual does do a better job of showing the assembly, and with a few replays, you can soon figure out which is the right order for the parts to go in, even if I did still manage to get one element back to front. Once the first section is complete, the rest of the turbine is very much a case of repeating the same steps over and over, sliding parts over their shafts, and then securing everything with many, many small nuts and bolts with the provided nut holder and Allen key. Towards the end of the build, when you've used most of the nuts and bolts, we install the main shroud, covering up about two thirds of the turbine, which after having painstakingly attached all of those fiddly little nuts and bolts all the way round it, I can't help but feel that it was a little bit unnecessary, given that we now can't see them anymore. At least we know the turbine sections won't be separating anytime soon. Finishing touches include attaching a motor and gearbox to the front end and attaching the nose and tail cones. The AAA batteries are hidden in the front pedestal, which has a switch underneath and a wire running out the side into the nose cone. It would have been nice to see this run through a little bit more discreetly and to especially have the switch on the side so you don't need to pick up the whole thing to turn it on. In doing so for the first time, it was a bit anticlimactic as the little gearbox on the front really did struggle to turn this thing and it was definitely far from quiet. Regardless though, the end result is still quite impressive and it could be an interesting desk piece or just general conversation starter. How accurate is it? Well, as I said at the beginning, I love turbines but don't know too much about what goes into them. So I don't really know. Maybe seeing some fuel lines, fuel injectors, a spark plug would all be nice. I would definitely prefer seeing this being made either from injection molding or at least printed through a resin printer for a better print quality. And it definitely needs a better manual. They do seem to have now a few metal versions, which seem to be more detailed and hopefully have a better finish. But if this one already feels expensive for what it is, that one is a big leap of faith. And I'm not sure everyone needs to run out and buy one of these, but those who have seen it seem to think it's rather cool. And as I'm almost over quite how many little nuts and bolts I had to uh, install into it, I would tend to agree. Anyway, that's the end of this episode of Cool Tech. It's the first one we've done for quite a long time. So if you enjoy this kind of content, let me know in the comments below, along with any products that you feel worthy of doing this kind of review for. Or if you just want to point out that you saw that one of these parts is installed back to front throughout the entire video, feel free to do so. 
Maybe I saw it, maybe I didn't. Either way, I didn't fancy taking out all those nuts and bolts to rectify it for this video. So that's a project for a rainy day. Until then, I hope you enjoyed the video. Leave us a like if you did, subscribe if you aren't already, and I'll see you all in the next one.